You are listening to Radiant Creators, a collaborative project composed of people whose passion, purpose, and dedication requires forging their own unique path of empowerment and livelihood. A Radiant Creator isn't making a living, they are living. Laura Bombier is a renowned adventure photographer and videographer, a passionate and fearless world traveler, a shark lover, scuba diver, jungle chef, and entrepreneur. She has crafted her own unique visual storytelling style by directly engaging in the energy of others, loving something enough to make a career out of it, and pricing her effort and talent accordingly. In this shape-shifting, improvisational conversation, we discuss the value of weaving the fabrics of indigenous and modern culture, the importance of vision quests, the life of being an artist, why funerals should be photographed with the same zeal as weddings and birthdays, and how to balance the artistic mind with the business mind. It's always a new day, you know? Everybody has crappy days or, you know, challenging time, challenging days um, in the world of being an artist, but, you know... We were just talking about that. We were saying, you know, you just wake up sometimes and it's just one of those days and there's nothing Mm -hmm. you do. I mean, I try to shake it. Oh, yeah, you know, but you just go to sleep and the next day it's different. (laughs) We're trying to figure out what is the factor? What is it that makes that happen? So bizarre. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's, you know, as an artist, we're tenacious folk, you know, we're we're constantly striving forward. And um, although I've always found it interesting you know, reading about musicians or friends that I know that are musicians that or some of them anyway, tend to do their best work when they're, they're in a low spot or they're in a struggle. Mm -hmm. That's when their sort of epic music comes out. um, Versus, you know, when you're just doing great and being happy all the time, I guess. Well, happy is easy. It's kind of for amateurs, Mm -hmm. you know. (laughs) Happy is easy to sell. (laughs) Yeah, happy is easy. I think it was uh, George Burns once said, he was asked if you could make uh, anything, what would it be? And he said, I'd I'd make a sad movie. And people ask, well, why? I don't know. I forget why. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) But but to further your point, I think, you know, and that's the thing I love sometimes about challenging people with, photos or you know just visual images is that we can start to become afraid of our own emotions you know and Mm -hmm. um and not be present enough and so you know I've had people say well I hate that photograph or I don't like the way that photograph makes me feel and I I will take that as a compliment because Mm -hmm. life isn't always you know for lack of a better term a bowl of cherries um and when you know you're photographing people at any age, you know, showing the full gamut of emotions that we feel or the humanity, the, the most human aspects of us. Um, that's the beauty, I think, in what I do, mm-hmm. you know? You know, we always like to, so I mean, the interview has already started, so that's <laughs> wonderful. I like that. We we really here our strive to just have conversations with people and sort of get out of that interview mode because interviews are always sort of stilted that was kind of boring it's like okay here's question number one um yeah you know and my follow-up uh (laughs) you know uh we want to keep this very uh you know improvisational here and um well actually one thing about difficulties really being where we create there isn't a, a I mean, it's a bit stoic, and it's it's hard to get through. It's very monotone, but Thomas More wrote a book called, I believe it's Dark Night of the Soul, and it's about the Dark Night of the Soul and about all that can come from it. And it really is, uh, we don't take it seriously enough in our, in our culture where he mm-hmm. talks about how other cultures would actually celebrate mm-hmm. it, like uh, the Vikings would actually call it the Time of Ashes, when mm. you were depressed and you were in, in, in that dark night, you would actually uh, take the ashes from the fire, from the fire pits and cover your body in those. And you would just lay around and you'd be depressed and, and the community would support you wow. and, and, and help you with that process. And they realized that this is actually important. It isn't something to, uh, uh, they weren't into antidepressants. No. Well, and we've gotten away from that community. I mean, I mean, how many things that we can talk about like that, whether it's, um, you know, a boy becoming a man or, you know, f- the feminine, you know, in the Native American mythology, um, a community raises a child um, and they celebrate those transitions. Um, and I think when you put all of that energy behind something like that, 
it, it's just on every, on every level, it helps to push that process forward, whether it's being out of a depressive state or, you know, taking on the responsibility of, you know, being a man, um, you know, with these traditional, um, things that they would do, like, um, when the boy, they would send in the, in American, Native American mythology, they send the vision quest, you know, these rituals that, you know, the community gets behind, which I think it sort of hands the torch to somebody and gives them the responsibility and, and they have to, by virtue through the, all that energy, own it and, and move forward. I, I can't say how you could not. Yeah, and I think that there is, in our culture today, right right now, there is, uh, it's all about avoiding that that moment. Mm-hmm. Or why do you least. think that is? I wonder why. I mean, all of these, like you're saying, these other countries, you know, we look at North America as so forward thinking on in so many levels, but yet, and I found that with our Beyond Survival series with the Survivor Man, um, the show that we did, uh, you know, we, we, we move away from all of these things that almost show our vulnerability and, and our collective conscious whole. I think because we're not a, a aware of our collective conscious whole, I would say, um, cause we are, I mean, if we look at ourselves, we're sort of intellectual, we're emotional, we're spiritual, we're physical. And right now we have an imbalance on the physical and mm-hmm. also possibly you can do a default life and that's what I'll call it is a, 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 a default life. Uh, you could, if you could put enough information into a computer about an individual, you could kind of predict their life. Mm-hmm. And that's what I think a lot of people are living. And that's a very linear default life. But yeah. what about the individual who all of a sudden has this spark of self-awareness, something happens, and not only they're connected with their with their soul, but also all of humanity. It's like Joseph Campbell said, you know, you go to the center of the labyrinth to slay a monster, but you find yourself. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. we're just, we're maybe we are ultimately missing that vision quest. We're missing that, uh, uh, maybe that's what it really is, finding your own way, finding your own path. There seems to be an aversion to that. Yeah, and, it, and maybe that's fear-based, and um, there's a disconnect maybe in, in what, we val- what we look at as the human, you know, what's been presented to us, you know, from these, you know, the greeting card sort of concept versus what it really should be. And, you know, I, I remember asking um, a chief one day when we were talking about the vision quest, and I, and I was like, well, what happens if the boy goes and he spends this all this time, you know, days in, in the woods and he doesn't have a vision and he just kind of looked at me and he's like, well, well, that doesn't matter. What matters is that he did it. And it's, it's the process of doing it that that gets you to that next step. It's not like, you know, you actually go into the woods and you have this vision all the time. It's just that you, you did it and you went, you got through it and you got to the other side. Yeah, it's it's actually uh, showing up for those deeper aspects of showing life. Up. Showing mm-hmm. up, you know, it, it doesn't matter if you, yeah, because your vision quest did happen, and yes. it, just because you didn't, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, so that's mm-hmm. what everybody needs to do is is go on that uh, vision quest, and that oftentimes to be, just maybe there's an aversion to following truly what excites us. Mm-hmm. You know, like like a uh, following. Uh, it, it's really a connection to one's soul, like connecting to that, and then what excites you, and really what excites you, what interests you. That will be your vision quest. It's interesting as we're talking. I'm thinking, what a great, you know, cause from the marketing side of my brain. You know, such a great segue, of course, to from a vision quest to photography. But I'm like, well, that could be like a really interesting way of presenting a photographer myself to the world like this let's let's go on a journey of a vision quest to find yourself let's do a storytelling let's you know let's oh. be vulnerable oh yeah we we don't mind royalties at all <laughs> <laughs> Well, the world is so set up these days with the whole love and light and bliss. Everything has to be blissed out these days. And so it doesn't, it, it doesn't encourage you to 
go deeper and examine your pain and examine. We're already talking, so this is great, but oftentimes we'll start uh, talking to people with a, an icebreaker. And well, for you, we did not need one, but. Um, <laughs> That's because we're both having wine and yeah, I'm actually having, having dark chocolate. <laughs> oh, I know. Dark we just rescued a baby bird. <laughs> yes. Oh. Yeah. Oh, Adorable. Yeah. yeah. yeah That's, we, there's your Instagram post right there. That's the story. <laughs> there you go. It'll be up. Yeah. Oh, it'll definitely be put up there. You've been around many indigenous cultures, ultimately. You could say uh, natural humans is what I prefer rather than indigenous, you know? Yes. You've been around many natural humans or people who are closer to being natural. Uh, There's an interview we did with author Haynes who talks about, he calls it, uh, they might be aboriginal, but we're striving to be the neo-aboriginal, the new aboriginal people. What is the average city dweller or the average individual? What can we learn from them? Yeah, what can we learn from them? Like, what, what oh. is, may, maybe, is, is there like one thing which is a bit of a gaping hole that you see missing in society at this moment? I find, you know, the tragedy, the one thing that sort of always sort of crept up for me was just this idea of dismissing their knowledge or experience or you know, their connectedness, connectedness to to nature and that, you know, everything that we've got going on and moving forward in our, you know, um, industrial world or our, you know, we're so much more forward thinking than they are. And, and, and I feel that's just such a, a, such a great tragedy because, you know, some of the places I've been to, you know, they can create these rules or these taboos, um, but it allows them to exist in, in a way that, they can survive and you know we can come in and say well that's wrong or that's you know that's doesn't against our religion etc cetera, etc cetera, and 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 try to change their mentality about it and and just instead of sort of i think in integrating it or becoming you know so the fabrics come together of the two societies or the two peoples you know what i mean i like that the idea of the fabrics coming together and so it's a woven, so we're woven together versus conquering and, and just overtaking. And, you know, I'm reading Sapiens and it's, it's depressing, you know, because I think we're flawed as humans, you know, and the, the history of Homo sapiens and, and we're like, you know, it's some of it, I'm just, I have to put down the book every once in a while and think I, I can't read this because I want us to be in a different place or to be better people overall. And the history History doesn't pr- doesn't show that. <laughs> oh, it's true. It's true. And history is always a bit skewed. Like when we look at history, we don't. We only know what was written. We don't necessarily know what happened. True. And like for me, being part Native American, I really went on a quest. Like for many many years, I guess I still have it to to learn more about the Native Americans of this country. And I realized that. Um, the relationship with the settlers, the early Europeans that came here, and the American Indians, it's. Oh my gosh, it's so much more complex than most people think. I have to admit, I didn't get through Sapiens. I read probably half of it, and I have to get back to that one. Mm-hmm. And I did like it, but here's the deal. If you like Sapiens, um, somebody we interviewed, Arthur Haynes, who's been working on the kind of similar material forever, he has a okay. much more inspiring view, and his name is Arthur Haynes. We interviewed him. Okay. He, and he really talks about... Let's look at the native cultures. Let, let's look at our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Like they mm-hmm. were healthy and happy. They lived longer than we think. And yes. and so he gets into like who were they really? What was their life like? And now, so we look at ourselves right now and we think, well, okay, if our hunter-gatherer ancestors were a wolf, we're more like a basset hound, you know, right now. <laughs> and, and that's really hard to Love face. It. But if you look yeah. at like at like a wild turkey yes. or, or a chicken and like if you skin it, if you've been there, you've seen yes. this, then you look at like a butterball, you realize, unfortunately, folks, you look like a butterball more than a wild yeah. turkey or a chicken. Yeah. But we can make it back to German Shepherd in our lifetime. And if we have kids, they can get back to that wolf. Do you, th- uh, do you think that's possible? I think it's possible. Yeah, check out, it's called A New Path. It's by Arthur Haynes. Okay. And he, he like, I liked Sapiens, but I felt that, um, yeah. I was feeling like, hey man, you need to cheer up a little bit, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Arthur Haynes, I think he did more study than that guy did actually mm-hmm. into what our hunter-gatherer ancestors were really like. And then he, he gets into... You know, how can we be a wolf again with an iPad? Interesting. Well, I'll pick it up. Well, I would like to ask some questions because I know many people that want to go into photography 
mm-hmm. and they're very, very good photographers. And I would just like to know what that spark was that led you to do what you're doing right now. What, what made you become a visual storyteller? You know, it's funny. Um, my father, when he was alive, used to, he's one of those, you know, back in the Crotochrome 64 days. And we had a, I had a dark room in our bathroom in the house, you know, and I'd come home from school and he'd be in there like doing crazy stuff. So I was always sort of around it. And then when I got to high school, um, picked up a camera and started shooting, you know, what I would call visual stories for the yearbook. And, you know, they just, my photos kept on getting published in the yearbook and it was such a great feeling, um, and a great way for me to express myself. Um, you know, I feel like storytelling is a, is a universal language and it crosses all walks of life, all borders, you know, a photograph can, can be so many things. And so it just started from there. And, um, and then I went to school and here I am turning 50. Uh, I've been in this space for probably 20 years now and it's shape shifted. You know, you create your own unique style. Um, I looked at what was around me and what other photographers were doing. And, and of course, back then, it wasn't the information age that we have now with cell phones and Instagram and any of that. So, you know, there was just a handful of people and they were all doing a certain style of photography. And for me, it was always very important to to have my own unique style. So I created what I would consider something very new at the time because when I was entering into photo competitions, like they didn't even have a category for me to enter my photos into. Um, everything was very structured. So ironically, like you're talking about the interviews that you do, you know, that interviews can be so, you know, structured and not free flowing. And so the photography at the time was very much like that from a portrait standpoint. And so I just turned it on its head completely and, started doing these, you know, candid black and white, uh, day in the life, you know, literally storyboards almost, um, which I felt were a way for children to be celebrated from all the emotions and the things that they feel. And, and I felt like it was a gift that I was giving to a child so that when they grew up and became an adult, they would have this snapshot of this, this storyboard of who they were as, as a young child. What was the category? What, what, would, what would you consider the category that wasn't available at that point? Just that, you know, for the photojournalistic, candid, black and white, you know, this was 20 years ago. So a lot of people in, in the space that I was around, you know, in the States, I was coming to the um, PPA&E, the Professional Photographers of New England, um, and even up in Canada here, it was all color, uh, very structured Dan, like photographs with soft focus and mm. you know people sitting posed very stiff like so I showed up saying you know for me you know I want to do something very free and you did it I want to capture characters I want to capture real stories real emotions vulnerability um everything everything that's that's authentic Oh, I like that. The the most human aspect of us. And it's interesting. So then, you know, and I started out my career doing children and or photographing children. And, and I loved doing that because I felt that they were the most authentic and they, you know, I could connect with them at a level that, because they, they would just sort of open themselves to you. And there was something that was so real about it. And so you start bringing in adults because we lose our sense of, of, being a child as we grow old, we get inhibitions and so, and children are so free. So it spoke to me at the time, you know, that it really allowed me to do that kind of work I was doing at the time. Well, when did your love of adventure start to permeate that passion you have for photography? Um, well, I traveled around a lot shooting the children, um, or photographing the children. And, and then from that, um, I, I owned a bar and I used to hire less survivor man to play in my bar. This was long before survivor man. And so we always knew each other. And then I got a call a couple of years later from him and he, and at that time I had been doing a lot of traveling as well. My father 
I had a, a yacht in the Bahamas and I, I grew up with an adventuresome father doing crazy things that most children would never do. <laughs> and I have nine lives and I've probably used up 12 of them, but, um, <laughs> Yeah, it was just a natural transition for me and to go from from that kind of a childhood to, you know, less saying, okay, well, you know, do you want to go to Ecuador and photograph there? And, you know, I've been shooting adventures with him for probably eight, nine, ten years now. Um, It's it's part of my DNA. (laughs) I found that whenever an individual has a passion for something or an interest in something that always overrides their inhibitions, their their fears. Like for me, I had a couple of awful flights and then I was afraid of flying for a couple of years and then I had just place I wanted to go and I thought, okay, I don't like these aluminum death tubes, but I'm going to get back on one and go. And mm-hmm. so I can't help but think about when you guys were doing the Beyond Survival series and especially in Peru, those roads looked terrifying. Oh, yeah. And, and, and do you find that when you have that, uh, that, so it seems like your passion drove you to do things that most people would would not do they'd say nope i'm not gonna do that well yeah and it's funny you wonder what it is that you know it's that will to live or that survival instinct um you know i was the only female on our very small crew of men um and we had some tough tough times i mean we started talking about setting up a website we would call miserable moments in filmmaking (laughs) you know but you know, nothing terrible ever happened. I mean, we had bad situations, but, um, you know, people got sick from malaria, et cetera, but you know, that happens to people traveling all the time. And we were very lucky. I mean, Argentina was a very difficult shoot, um, for me and, um, another filmmaker, Max, um, Peru was physically a very, very difficult, um, shoot. It was a lot of, a lot of, walking over those mountains and those pathways and we weren't dressed for the weather because it wasn't supposed to be snowing you know so you're wet and cold a lot of the times but uh you know you cross that finish line and you've got something amazing captured on film and you're experiencing camaraderie with the team you're with and the and the locals you're meeting with in the middle of the mountains that uh you would never get to see you can't drive there you know you can't fly there um, and it becomes a very special sort of uh, transcending experience that, for me, it sort of made it all worthwhile. Well, once you're there, what is it that captures your eye? You know, when you're in Peru or you're with the Baju, I mean, is it the people? Is it the nature? Is it, is it overwhelming? Just such a different culture. It's, Where do you start? It's, um, for me, it's just the idea of wanting to celebrate it. Like, if I spend too much time sitting in Toronto, I, I get bored. I get I get itchy. I need to be there's so much of the world to see. And, um, for me, it's just, you know, you arrive at these places and you, and you show up and then you're there and you're engaging with, with these people in a very quiet way in the sense that you're celebrating them. You're not judging them. You're not, uh, exploiting them. You know, you're just being with them. And to me, there's, it's a very special, um, connection that you create. Um, and we're all, you know, all of these human aspects and these emotions that we feel it's, you know, it's, we all feel the same about life and death and, you know, the troubles that we all have, it's, we can relate. So I'm mm. going off on a tangent here, I guess, but oh, it, no, it's, tangents are great. Keep going. Yeah. We like it's, tangents. We like tangents. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, you go to these communities and they're so poor, what we would consider so poor, and, and they're so happy. That's you one know? thing I noticed when I was watching so the shows, happy. how happy they seem. Yeah. And I find as, we're, as I'm traveling, it's like you forget about all the luggage, all the things you have at home, all the things we think we need, you know? And you get back and you're like, oh, wow, I forgot I had that. Or, you know, all of a sudden, all these things that we think are so important to us, they, they really are irrelevant, you know? You get down to the basics. But then you see the tragedies, so, you know, being in the middle of the jungle in Papua New Guinea and, you know, the crew were stumbling through the jungle and the rain and the mud and the rocks. We can hardly walk with our rubber boots on. And, you know, the natives there are running through the bush with their bare feet that are webbed because they don't wear shoes. And 
they're surviving in a way that is we could, I could never do if I was alone in a jungle in that environment, I would have a tough time. Um, but yet they looked at all the things that we want, that we had, and they wanted them. They wanted our shoes and our boots, even though they wouldn't fit their feet. Like there's this part of a, our psyche, I think as humans is that we, we want what we can't have, or we always feel that if something we, if we don't have something, we need to have it or it needs, it will get us further ahead. But a lot of times it doesn't. You know, it's almost detrimental. I do not remember where, uh, who said this, but it was uh, a book by Robert Young Pelton, quite the uh, uh, adventure journalist, truly. And he was in Africa, and um, there was somebody who ran, he, he was a chief, and he said that uh, our people were wealthy until someone gave them the first T-shirt. Yeah, and that, and mm-hmm. that really struck me. Yeah, I read a story about... Um, and I don't remember where it was, but it was a, a tribe where they had, you know, these huge water vessels that were made out of pottery and clay and they were family heirlooms and they got passed down from generation to generation. And they had such huge value because you had to walk, I think, miles to this place to find this special clay and the water was stored in it, um, kept it cool for the, you know, during the hot times and all of a sudden plastic arrives and and all of a sudden these beautiful vessels become worthless it's like oh well there's plastic and they won't break and we can carry them and they're lighter and and the the way that the way that these water vessels were handed down from tradition or from generation to generation was with you know two hands and and there was such caregiving in that transition of of passing it down and and this author was writing about how and when plastic came on, of course, all the water was kept in plastic. It tasted like plastic. It never stayed cold. And then this process of caregiving. So if you handed someone a plastic bowl, you would hand it to them with one hand and sort of, here you go, because you weren't worried about dropping it. And he felt like that act would trickle down and would change how we treat each other. It's like when you shake someone's hand with two hands versus one hand, right? It's There's a, a difference in the energy that you're passing on or the caregiving. The history of something is part of its meaning. I get that. Mm-hmm. And, and, and like the quality and the construction. It's why we tend to value, you know, family heirlooms. Like, like why, yeah. do they, why do they have value? Mm-hmm. And especially, I mean, there's plenty of family heirlooms that we all have that are uh, monetarily worthless, but mm-hmm. yet they're precious. So it seems like you're really speaking of the, the, uh, the true value of something and, uh, 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 and, and that being part of a, a tribal, uh, a tribe or, the, or a society. Yeah. And, but the, even the just simple idea that it's, it's a breakable and that if we, if we take care in, in, in breakables, how does that transfer into caretaking of each other? Because we can, we all can break, you know, whether I don't mean, you know what I mean by that, but it's, it's just, I saw a definite path between the two. In my mind, anyway. No, I get it. So, the you know, and it's from the adventure aspect, I feel like if we had more, if we were connected more to other parts of the world and other peoples, we would be kinder to each other on some level, I think. You know, we'd have this greater sense of responsibility. Oh, I think so. Uh, Henry Rollins, I think everybody probably knows who Henry Rollins is. If, uh, and he does his spoken word tour, tours where he goes around mm-hmm. and talks about his world travels. He's constantly traveling. And he makes an incredible point that it would it would really screw up war if Americans traveled more. Because yes. it's, it's really hard to bomb people that you know. You would yes. say, oh, wait, well, I've been there and that's that that's samson over there i mean we like yes. we had tea and smoked the hookah and he's a good guy i just don't buy there's a reason to bomb them yep yeah agreed so, so agreed. World, yeah so world peace could be easily achieved by americans traveling more and hopefully that's you know what we do you know within the film world is that you know we bring for the people that maybe can't travel for money or health um or fear you know but it's, there's, oh, I guess, a little bit of a disconnect. You know, if you're in there and you're feeling it and you're smelling it and you're tasting it, you're more apt to buy into it versus sitting in front of a TV. Um, I mean, the interview is definitely about you, of course, but in uh, Lester Oz, the Papua New Guinea a- mm-hmm. episode where he talked about, you know, maybe you're just exploring, maybe your adventures from an armchair 
and that's yeah. good. But I mean, at least if a person's doing that, so I mean, there's an incredible uh, value to what you're doing in presenting visual storytelling and saying, hey, here's the adventure. And then the person gets an excitement and an interest and um, they always take it from there. There's always the next step. Mm-hmm. I have an uncle um, who I love dearly who's was born and raised in Toronto. Um, he lives two hours north of Toronto and he's never been anywhere else in the world. And I know people that are from, I grew up in a small town that have never been anywhere, but in that small town. And I, I find that almost suffocating and I find it so tragic and I find it hard to understand. That desire to travel, it's, it's tough. I mean, a person has to have it and explore it and do it. And then it becomes a bit of an addiction you know, mm-hmm. and so that positive addiction of travel and then being a visual storyteller when you travel or a visual uh, cinematographer or writer, everybody has their job in our society. And I look at mm-hmm. it like if you're doing yours well, then those that are watching will will get it. I mean, do, do mm-hmm. you ever feel that, that, that responsibility to go forth and show people and then also kind of create a path? Like in India, there's this great... Uh, holiday and I don't remember what it is but it's this where they all honor they they, they honor those who the, the enlightened masters that made a path for them that didn't, yes. that, that didn't have to incarnate didn't have to come back but they did to help make up to walk yep. the path for them or else they'd be so lost so that seems to be what you're doing do you ever feel what that the role is. Yeah. yeah yeah the role for sure I mean to speak about my uncle again, he would sit, he's probably seen every Nat Geo show there is. And he knows probably more about some of these calls. Some of the places I was going to and beyond survival, he'd be like, Oh, well that's where this and this and this is. And can you bring me back one of those? And, um, so there's, you know, there's clearly a desire there to, to know and to have that knowledge, but it's the act, act of doing. And so if we didn't have those people that were out there carving those paths, um, we would be, you know, so disconnected, uh, um, as human beings. And I feel that, you know, when I started getting into underwater photography, it's the same thing from on a, on a different level with, with sharks. I mean, we have this fear, um, of sharks and, you know, less than I got into diving and, and doing a lot of ocean preservation and, um, you know, I remember my first underwater shoot was with, was during a shark feeding frenzy. And I, mean, I grew up on boats and being around sharks, et cetera. So I was never really afraid of them, but there's a lot of people that think that what we were doing was absolutely insane. But I feel like if we're not out there doing it and not out showing that, that these things can be done and you can experience fear and, and get past that barrier that there is such beauty to be, to be seen. No, I definitely get you. Yeah, and I mean, I would say sharks seem pretty horrifying, but <laughs> uh, you know. But I guess understanding helps. I mean, I remember when I lived in Southern California and I surfed a lot, and I'd see the little white tip fins pop up around me now and then, and I thought that's damn terrifying. But there still was that desire for surfing, that desire for that adventure. There was. I think I was probably constantly really friggin' scared, and I thought I was going to drown or be eaten, but there was that excitement, there was that that desire. It's like death, an injury, a possible misfortune, but yet it seems like if you're following a path of excitement through it, then it sort of creates this force field of protection around mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And but things and things can go, it's funny, like and I totally understand what you're saying and I feel like I've felt that before. You know, riding on a sailboat with this like crazy maverick of a man who reminded me a lot of my father and, you know, was in a windstorm. And but a part of it maybe is an energy level, right? Because I grew up as a child on a lake. And so it's like, oh, there's there's a, a storm coming. Let's get out the windsurfers, you know, and we didn't think twice about the fact that maybe there was lightning or something coming. You know, it was just like that's when the highest winds were. So there's a comfort level, I think, that almost brings a certain energy into play that might allow you on some level to cross that finish line without having, any, having anything go wrong. Not that you're always in control. Mother Nature clearly can be. But having sat on the boat in situations with other people who are, like, turning green and, you know, 
they freeze completely. So then they become part of the problem at the same time, right? Which if you were in that headspace, it would be so easy to have something go wrong, right? Oh, so if you're, cha- if you're channeling that, that strength and that energy and that you're in that, you know, place where you transported yourself, and maybe that's egotistical to say, but you, you almost, how could you not succeed? It's real. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's really, it's uh, real. yeah, it's really speaking of just a, a technology that does exist. And just because it's a bit of a esoteric technology doesn't mean that it's not real. Yeah. yeah. That again, those things speak to me in that sense of the, you know, the most human aspect of who we can be. And so in those and adventure places or those emotional places, to me, that's, that's the space that I, I like to sit in and be in and, and create in and whether it's photographing or filming, um, you know, and I've started interestingly enough, and it's nothing that I don't see anybody doing it here in Canada. Um, and there might be one or two people I've seen on the internet in the States, but this idea of, you know, filming and photographing capturing funerals which i think would be such an important thing and it's nothing that we do you know we we celebrate weddings and and a birth but dying is just as important as 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 living and um so that's where i'm at right now is just a small side of my business where i'm sort of creating this environment that you're educating people at the same time because people are like oh why would you want to photograph a funeral but there's so much that goes on at a funeral that I think is so important. Well, that goes back to the whole, oh, I just want to focus on the positivity and the light instead of what the real deal is. This is, this is a cycle of life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we just want to toss it aside. Yeah. Or we don't, we think it's ugly or we, we don't want to look at it or, you know, or it just came from, my father died 15 years ago, very suddenly. And, um, the funeral was very difficult. I was very, I was full of so much grief. Um, but we had this amazing non-traditional funeral that I have no record of because I don't remember any of it because I was so emotional. Um, and so I started thinking about this a year or two ago and thinking, well, if I had something of that, if I had a video, if I had photographs, I could now, you know, even if it's 15 years later, I would have something to look at. And to, and to celebrate in those moments because it was all part of him. And I don't have that. And so I think, I think that's an important thing. Being a storyteller is definitely, that's as ancient as any organized society that exists. So making, mm-hmm. it, making it visual certainly makes sense. It's a bit of a progression. We all know about wedding photographers. I mean, there's, a, there's plenty of wedding photographers mm-hmm. out there. But mm-hmm. I just, I, I'm enamored. I'm amazed. I love the idea of being a funeral photographer Mm -hmm. i mean i bet if i google that i'm not going to find many i need and and there really needs to be uh like for aaron and i when we are traveling is to is to go see uh graveyards and Mm -hmm. the older the better and especially if you go down south or you know different places of the country you see anybody who cannot be absolutely captivated and just feel the soul of a culture a people a place yeah i mean a, a I think actually a person could be something that I know Aaron and I have done quite a lot is uh, graveyard photography. Yes. I mean, there is, I did pa- too. There is power there. Yeah. With, um, I did it actually with infrared film. What did you see with infrared film? Well, just, it's the light. It's, um, in fact, and I also shot, I shot a bride and a groom in a graveyard because, and not to, you know, it was more from an artistic standpoint, but they were a pretty cool couple as well. And we did it all in infrared film. And so, it just changes the way everything looks and the way the light's reflecting off of it. So this perception of what we have as death isn't really what it is. It's, it's more about light. Well, there was one thing that when you were talking about your uncle, it kind of popped in my head. What about those people that never leave their places they have been born and they live in these little tiny towns? Aren't they kind of like an indigenous culture in America? Wouldn't they be kind of interesting to photograph? This is, it just oh. popped in my head. I was like, oh, that'd be yeah. kind of a fun one. Oh, agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, and I, cause I drive around a lot. I end up in these little towns and, and I do get nostalgic. Like I can, I was in yesterday, literally in this little town close to where I'm from. And, you know, they had these old, it wasn't an antique store. It was just a place that had a lot of really old things. And, and I started thinking about the people that own those things that lived in that town who were, who were they and what did they do and did they go anywhere? And 
you know, what was their, da- like their daily adventure might have been just the hardships of life, you know? One of our favorite places was going through Pennsylvania here in America. And there's so many, it has a lot of European influences, like they call small towns boroughs. And mm-hmm. you, you can see the Amish there and you can see all these small towns in the middle of Pennsylvania. I mean, a lot of it is still extremely rural. It, it, if you see it from a plane, it's pretty much a forest. And I mean, oh, it's like walking through modernized history. Yeah, they, they have their it. own accent, their, you know, a particular architecture, the way they say, th- what they say, what they, the terms they use. Interesting. And yeah, all throughout. And I thought it'd be really interesting when you mentioned your uncle to, instead of going around the world, wouldn't it be interesting to just go to small, tiny little podunk places you know, yes. around and just interview those people and take pictures of them? Definitely. Yeah. 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 Maybe I'll also pop drive into the car tomorrow and head down to Pennsylvania. <laughs> oh yeah. It'd be a bit of a drive. I but... find accents I find accents so interesting. Like you can if you're driving in Europe or in driving, you know, in parts of Canada even, like what is it that determines an accent when you go from place to place where there's a transition or whether it's, you know, a very definite line of how people sound. Yeah, accents are so the, strong. But what is the what's the deciding factor? So if you and I were to hang out in a room together, and we had different accents, which one would would dominate, and why? Yeah, it's interesting to think about. And people tend to take on the accent of where they are. I mean, just taking a very superficial guess here, but it seems like it's the land, in. it's the location. I think it's more than it could be to fit in, definitely. Uh, uh, but I think that it seems that. People take on accents almost subconsciously without knowing. Because, I mean, I've known people who went and lived, let's say, down south, or they went to the, uh, like, so I lived, I was, I was born in Wilmington, Delaware, then I lived in California for a long, old time. Mm-hmm. And when I went to California, people would say, you sound funny, and I didn't know what they meant, right? And so, <laughs> and so then I went back to Delaware, and people said, you sound funny. <laughs> you sound Californian. And I'm like, what? I never did anything consciously. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? So it seems like, I'm just guessing, like, to fit in, yes. But also, it seems like a place is the accent. Because that's very true. Where does an accent come from? Because I can, like, speak for here. It's almost tribal. Yeah, it's almost mm-hmm. tribal. Because here in the States, I mean, you look at somebody who's from New Jersey, then from somebody who's from Georgia, somebody who's from Florida. But don't you find, like, the, like I know people that, have lived here for 20 years that are from England that live in an area where there isn't, they're the, they're the one person that has an English accent and they still have a very strong English accent. Mm. So, mm. And, and so part of me wonders on a subconscious level, maybe it's their ego of liking to be sounding different or, you know, and if someone was maybe a little bit less, you know, secure, if they just wanted to sort of blend in, you know, on maybe on, on a subconscious level, they're just, changing how they sound so that they're less prominent i don't know i've always found it very interesting and there's yeah that would be one i mean actually that'd be an incredible uh visual storytelling right there if you could photograph accents (laughs) could you actually how how do they look that's the truth how does an accent look how could you photograph that because gosh i mean if you go especially i would say here in america down south to georgia there you go and go to Older parts of Georgia that are mm-hmm. uh, less touched uh, by modern society, and uh, I swear you can see it. You, you can see okay, so here here in America. I mean, we we move around a lot. I mean, everybody's from everywhere, but many places in this country you can still see the history of a place. It seems like maybe an accent looks like the history of a place. Mm-hmm. Some people you can see their ancestors in their face. In, mm-hmm. in in their mannerism, and you can hear it in their accent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and then I, I heard somewhere too that um, that it takes three generations for something like the, for Holocaust to sort of come out of come out of a life. You know what I mean? Or to, to for us to lose it on a cellular level, the trauma of that. It has to be three generations for it to not be such a, a prominent thing that's carried on. And, and you know what I mean by that? Oh, completely. Um, we actually have uh, worked with um, somebody we interviewed on the show, Eric Rains, and he does, I mean, and, and a person can believe in such things or not, but uh, he works on uh, 
clearing thing like so each of us has a like a a a family history or racial history to to clean to to uh to to clear you know eras of our mm-hmm. past you might say and yep. so he actually and it's phenomenal. All I, all I could, I would say, I mean, a person may believe such things or not, but if they work with him, it it was a phenomenal experience for me. And he can he can see what you're what you're bringing from your your past, really? your culture, your family, and he can actually uh, see it in your energy and say, "Oh, look at this! You know, here's something from," uh, and he can pinpoint it and say, "This is when." this affected your 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 lineage and he can actually help clear that in this moment so interesting <laughs> yeah interesting and, and you feel it energetically and you go oh my gosh i never realized i was carrying around like yeah, it can something, be for, something from a hundred years ago or more yeah in your lineage yep yep interesting yeah. well and then when we did the um veda ceremony for beyond survival um one of the gentlemen that was with us and the crew member had had an uncle that had just died, and he they could see the uncle on his shoulder. Oh my you know? gosh! So I think it's I think there's something to be said for that. It's interesting, and it leads me to you know as you're talking and thinking about this assignment I had back when I was studying photography, where you had to photograph yourself as how you saw yourself. And then photograph yourself on how you thought other people saw you. Oh my gosh, that's that's profound. It was very profound exercise to go through in your head because we all know how we think and feel. And I've had this conversation with lots of people too. Like there's, I always feel like there's a certain age I've always felt. No matter how old I am, I just feel this age. And I think that plays a role in it as well. Is how how I how how do if you could photograph so if you're photographing an accent how does that look or if you could pho- if you're photographing yourself how do you want to be perceived or how do you think you really are perceived? Oh, I and like I think it. They're very different things. The Radiant Creators audience out there, hey, take a <laughs> take a picture of an accent and send it to us. If you can capture that, we will definitely post it on the on the show notes <laughs> because I would, you know. So you've been given an assignment. Okay, there's like you guys yes. listen. You have the easy life. You know, now artists can do it too. Artists can do it oh, too. Oh yeah. No, well, there is one thing going to artists, and I have some friends that are interested in hearing what you have to say about this question. Okay. Is how do you, you're such an amazing business person. So how do you balance your creative mind with your business mind? Because you do a stellar job at it. Um, well, it's funny. It wasn't, it's not always easy. Um, and I think a big, the big part of, you know, being an artist is to really know where your strengths and your weaknesses are. Um, in the beginning, it was like, I felt like I had to do it all. I I didn't grow up with mentors or people that were sort of guiding me along in in this path. In fact, I think when I was like, I'm going to have a career in photography, everybody said I was nuts, including my parents. I would never, you know, make any money doing it. And, um, and I get what's, you know, a definition of successful. I mean, I feel like I've had such a full, um, successful life in the experiences that I've had. And there's, there's a richness in that, but, um, the business aspect you know, for the things that I hated doing, like math and bookkeeping, um, I just eventually started hiring someone to do that because it made me more efficient in my business and gave me more time to do the things that I was really good at, which was taking photographs, which would actually make the money that would enable to pay her to do the work that she was doing. So you just hire, you just hire people to help you. You weren't trying to do it yourself and just, you just, no, no, not when it came to the, to the bookkeeping and all of that. It's, I, the last thing I want to be doing is adding numbers and receipts up. <laughs> so is, is that what you're doing now? So when you're, you, you know, these days you have to have a social media presence, which I think takes a lot of time. I have a hard time with it as an artist myself. Yeah. So what do you do about that sort of that aspect? The social media stuff I love. I mean, I've always been a creator in the sense that um, when I was doing my photography and I, I would design these full page ads because myself, I learned how to use all these programs because if I was going to buy an ad in a magazine, the person designing my ad would be designing 50 other ads for that week. And I thought, you know, how much, I'm sure they're going to look good, but I wanted mine to look great and I wanted it to stand out above everything else. So, um, I made ads that were, were very different from, 
from what was out there so that that everything I was doing from start to finish stood out above the the noise, quote unquote. And then I would charge accordingly because I felt like what I was offering was unique and there was huge value to that. So for me, the goal was always, you know, not to work seven days a week, but to work with intention and make money accordingly. So it's like if I had one photo shoot that was really, that spoke to the brand and the type of feeling of the work I wanted to present, I would shoot that and then, but I would charge a lot of money for it versus, you know, I'm going to shoot everything that comes along and none of those things would actually together as a whole create a certain look or feeling that I would have as an artist. Does that make sense? Yeah, you you believed in your passion and your skill and you and you asked the right price for it. You also believed in a healthy competition. Exactly. And mm-hmm. also but to create a to create a when you create your unique style, you can't water it down with other work that doesn't speak to that look or feel. So, you know, I would say no to the jobs that maybe they would be money coming in, but it's like I wouldn't do a, a school portrait where I was setting up lighting and a very structured thing. Um, I would rather be out, you know, with the, with the little boys, um, with the magnifying glass and ants in the back <laughs> yard, you know, playing with the kids and doing and shooting that kind of real, real life stories, which is, and I didn't want to water that down with anything else. So it's mm-hmm. like, this is what I do. And if you don't want this, then you have to hire someone else. Oh, that's just the advice we needed. Thank you. Yeah. It's hard because it gets scary because, you know, but I feel like if you present it in a way that is profound and and it shows strength and confidence in what you're doing and you don't dilute it with anything else, it's you can charge accordingly for it. And, and then that's all you're doing. And you're creating a look and a feel to the world and presenting it to the world. Yeah, getting rid of what doesn't serve and, exactly. just, and just doing what you're good at. And that's definitely scary to some extent. I mean, uh, at least... I felt that for myself, where it seems like you turn down sometimes more than you do, and and especially when you're uh, looking to pay the rent and such, that can be a mm-hmm. bit that can be a bit nerve wracking. I guess that really takes a take a stand. Uh, it, 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 does. it does. My um, I have a painter friend of mine, Beverly Hawksley, who does amazing paintings, and she said to me once, "If you put the amount of energy into knowing you're going to have the money versus worrying about whether you're going to get it, everything shifts." That's yeah. so true. It's like a, a Buckminster Fuller said that uh, we worry and worry and worry. Uh, mm-hmm. But in truth, what actually, uh, none of it ever comes to pass. If you look at your life, not much that you've ever worried about has actually ever happened. And the misfortune that did uh, find you wasn't that big of a deal. And it was something you never expected. It totally blindsided you. Mm-hmm. So he took it from mm-hmm. a very scientific standpoint. He was like, don't worry because you don't know what's going to get you and it won't be that bad. Exactly. You know, and, and another one of her, I just love her daily, another, what I call her famous quotes was, you know, she would say to me, we always think everyone else is the expert, you know, and, and really I think as artists, each one of us in our own special way, we bring something profound to the table. And it's just knowing that, that, you know, that helps to push it all forward. And that's another thing I think missing in our in our society um, that we touched that we talked about earlier is we have a we defer to experts mm-hmm. far too much. Deferring to it's, experts is it's a bad habit because you can learn something, you can know something, you can have an interest, and you can know something about it. Mm. And what makes them an expert? Because they make a ton of money at a job? A lot of times it's just because they have expert next to their name. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, and we know that from, you know, how many, you know, not every doctor is an amazing doctor. Not every police or, you know, any of these people that hold these high, you know, title jobs, you know. Oh, but exactly. I think, you know, and it, and it speaks to the one of the notes that you had sent me about, you know, having a su- successful career you know, passion and, and courage, extremely important. Um, education, sure. I mean, I was schooled in, in photography and in journalism, but I don't think that it's necessary. Um, for me, it was, it showed me that I love something and enough that I wanted to make a career out of it. Um, 
but I know so many people that have just sort of, you know, it's, and, and look at the space now with social media, as you mentioned, it's people are, are making money in such different ways, it's telling different kinds of stories online, you know, and, and that's just a whole other arena of, of course, the problem with that is that you're fighting against algorithms and just put it out there. And hopefully the, you know, altruistic energy of something truly creative that is new will help it find its way to those who want to see it. Because yeah, Mm -hmm. in some situations, the deck is stacked against you. Mm -hmm. There's a lot, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of content. Well, there's also this certain, what I've noticed on social media, there's a certain presentation of what is cool or what is considered art, you know, as an Mm -hmm. artist. So you know, right now it's sort of like all this naturey, but it's oh, I I don't want to put anybody down or anything like that, but it's a uh, sort of badly yeah. drawn things. Like there's no skill. Like the worse mm-hmm. that it's that it's drawn, the better it's received. Yeah. And then they get these uh, licensing contracts and all sorts of crazy things. And oh, it's so daunting. And so that's why social media it's it's a it's a, a double edged sword, I would say. You know, so you agreed know, and. Yeah. And then Instagram, I, I love Instagram in the sense that, you know, I do live in a visual world. I think more visually more than I do with words. Like sometimes I'm like, I can see what I'm thinking, but it's hard getting out the words. And even when I was in high school, my teacher would be like, I can't read your mind. I, <laughs> I know what you're trying to say, but I expect you to write it down. I'm like, no, you just need to see inside my brain. You'll figure it all out. Um, uh, but, um, you know, and, and because of this information in the digital age, I think, you know, we're more apt to lean towards visual pictures. Bec- and, and if you can get the story in a photograph, because, you know, our attention spans have changed, you know, we, yeah. we spend less time looking and seeing. And, you know, when you start talking about or reading things about, well, how to make a successful Instagram um, feed and and they even talk about the entire the look of your page as a whole so if you're posting a picture it's like well it has to kind of match the one that's third down and to the right so that you know as a whole you know what you're posting has a kind of an art look to it versus each individual so it's like there's so many it's like a knife in the gut you know if you just want to be a creative artist you know (laughs) yeah yeah it's tiring (laughs) and I feel that I feel a lot of those things are taking us away you know, from our sense of self and, you know, we spend so much time on, on these platforms. Um, it affects, I think how we think it affects our memory. It affects, it affects our, um, as I said, our attention spans. It's, but yet we just keep barreling forward on the train. Yeah. We're learning a, a, a new way of expressing ourselves and a new way of seeing what is expressed. It's, uh, to our detriment though. To our detriment, definitely. Yeah. Uh, like somebody I know recently said that he worked, he had ADHD, and he said one of the ways he really worked with that was he would type his thoughts. Like mm-hmm. when he when he couldn't keep his mind from racing and he couldn't pay attention, he it would, would slow him down. It would slow him down, and then he really had some genius going on. So it's like, oh, it's strange, but humans are going through a a unique metamorphosis, and some of it yeah. is positive, and some of it, oh, definitely is not. Of course. I mean, we have to. So it's it's finding what is positive. And sometimes our positive evolution is we don't even know what it is yet. Maybe we can get a a hold of it in some ways. But then in many ways, we really can't. So being a pioneer is is good. But wow, I guess all the pioneers have always been sort of on their own. They've been making that path for others. And they they were lost. But at least there was yep. someone you could follow. Yep, agreed. Since we're coming to a close, I have these people that are waiting to hear what advice you would give to other radiant creators seeking to live the life of their dreams, like you. <laughs> yeah, and I definitely, I'll throw a quote in from you, actually. And this is a quote in the uh, uh, dedication to, I believe, Beyond Survival, uh, the author of the quote's unknown, but you mentioned the biggest adventure you can take is to live the life of your dreams. Wow. I mean, it's, it's a heavy statement, but it, it, (laughs) (laughs) and I feel that that adventure shape shifts as it goes on. And, but it, it's, and it's some days it's easier than others, but it's certainly putting down, you know, putting that fear into a little bag and putting it on the floor and, and, and walking away from it, um, you know, and, and to connect all the dots of those things I said earlier about, you know, just knowing, um, showing up, 
and knowing that you're on the right path. And when we get these signs, I think, and sometimes we get so busy in, in our day-to-day life or we're distractions or maybe in our own fear and we stop noticing the little signs that, that will tell us, you know, you're on the right path. And sometimes I find even when I'm traveling, because I'm, I'm a people person and I, as much as I love looking at nature photography and food photography, um, you know, my, my process is, is engaging in the energy of other people and that creates what I end up showing on film. But if I'm traveling in a place and I start to see people that look familiar to me or remind me of, or I might even think I know them, those little signs to me, you know, cause I, I know I don't know them, but it's, I'm on a path, I'm on a familiar path or a path that I'm supposed to be on. Little signs like that, I think are, are really important to, to pay attention to. Oh, it's definitely a very Celestine prophecy, you know. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you're you're uh, paying attention to your intuition. Yes, and it, it's it's about following your gut mm-hmm. and being into in your intuitive sense. I've been in so many places around the world, and you know, knock on wood, I've I've never had anything horrible happen to me. I've never been robbed. I've never, you know, there's been a few times where I've been like, well, that feels a little bit, you know, I'm gonna take a step back from that. But uh, you know, I think if you show up, being authentic and celebrating what you're doing, whether it's people or, and you come to it with that kind of energy, a uh, good energy. I, I feel like, you know, that's what you get back. Talk about being in the now when I have a camera and I'm with the person and I see somebody and I go up to him and I take the picture. I feel like I can remember that moment in my head more than with the camera. Okay. Well, so that's more of a, you're getting a return ticket then Yeah. for the holiday. Yeah. yeah. So there's a um, minor white. I don't know if you've ever read any of his quotes. No. Oh, you'd love his stuff. So he, but he talks about, you know, the idea that a photographer projects himself or herself into everything that they see, mm. um, and identify with it. And that, and he has the, the one of his quotes that I, I've used so many times that, um, no matter this, uh, No matter how slow the film, spirit always stands still long enough for the photographer that it has chosen. Well, that's somebody I need to look up. (laughs) Yeah. Heard of. Well, he says that all photographs are self portraits, you know? Ah. So it's. So something that you're shooting or connecting to speaks something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You should read his stuff. He's. I love him. Well, you know, I'm going to now. uh, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And, and, and then, and it's also, I think too, what you're talking about is, is, is what you're giving back. So whether it's maybe to you or to someone else or to, if five people see that photograph or 5 million, um, it was a line about, um, a good book makes us think and then feel a good photograph makes us feel and then think, mm-hmm. you know? And so this idea that, you know, if you're capturing these people and in, in these moments, especially as you said, like. There's such a variety of things that go on there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's I so think- many individuals, and the way that people present themselves is so fascinating. When you see somebody completely unique, oh, I just I, I would- beeline towards them. As and to talk about you know to sort of bring it full circle about you know creative story storytelling. You know, as you're mentioning some of the other people that you've interviewed, I was thinking, like, wouldn't it be really great for you to get all the people that you've inter- inter- interviewed together, <laughs> yeah. you know, at a con or at a room or a conference and just sort of like have a big debrief, creative debrief, you know? It's actually in the works. Yeah, it's, it's actually, funny yeah. you said that. We just looked at each other like, how does she know? That, yeah, that's, that, <laughs> that's definitely part of the uh, agenda of all this. Well, I'm, one more thing, and we don't have to put this on, but, you know, I'm the same will, age you are. Stop it. I'm the same <laughs> yeah. age you are. And don't you find, as a creative woman, that you're even more creative now? Um, or no? <laughs> I do. You know what I found has been... Um, because I started out doing it it so much for myself and then I started working with less. And so I funneled all of my creative energy towards his brand, um, for such a chunk of time. And so I'm now just focusing that energy back to me. So I'm in that transition place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I am, but I'm just, I'm, I'm really good at connecting the dots for other people. And I just need to put that energy back into myself because I have all these ideas and I, what I've done actually is put clipboards up on my wall in, in my office um, so that I don't 
I come up with all these great ideas, but I, I need to act on them and not forget about them. And so they're there, they're reminders of all, like I've got this, this, and this, and this, and they're all very different, mm-hmm. but they're all part of me and my process. Yeah. I uh, think as you unfold that, that will happen for you. <laughs> yes. And it's, it's creating the space for it, you know, mm-hmm. like, unfortunately, you know, and we, and sometimes we feel like we have to be doing all the social media stuff. And some of these things, they're just time suckers. And I that's, do find, that's what I as feel. I'm turning, yeah, I'm turning 50 and it's like, wow, there's not enough time left. And the days seem to go by faster. Thank you. That's where I'm at. Like, I want to yeah. be a creative artist. I don't want to, I just want to do my thing. Oh, I can't yeah. wait to see you, what you're going to be doing the next couple of years. Yeah. You don't want to build the gallery. You just want to put the stuff in it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so where are you guys? Arizona. My girlfriend goes there all the time. She's a big golfer. I, I, I couldn't oh, yeah. be bothered. Who, who wants to hit her? I'm sorry if I'm offending you guys, no. but the oh, idea of hitting not. a white ball around a thing, I'm like, are you we, kidding me? We say that all the time. Like, no. what is it? And we're in the desert, and they have to keep these the, the, the grass green, and so it's Oh, yeah. yeah. Don't even yeah. get me started on the environment. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. We're there with you. I understand. Well, golf, to me, I've always seen it as the ultimate declaration of domestication. <laughs> And disdain for nature. Yeah. Well, and I just got a visual of that turkey, so there must be some connecting dots there. Exactly. Exactly. Like your environment should look like a jungle, but it looks like a golf course. (laughs) Well, thank you so much. I feel very honored um, to be a part of your uh, creative process. This gets listened to by a lot of people who never see a website per se. It's on a lot of different feeds. So... Uh, what's next that you're working on right now and where can people get a hold of you? Where can people find your stuff? Um, well, on Instagram and my website. Um, and I also, I'm sure you've, well, you've spoke about the book earlier, but um, please, uh, you know, look for the book, buy it. Um, it's available in bookstores across the country. Um, and I'm working on another little book right now um, on adventure women and, and it's called Bush and the Outback. <laughs> it's about one of the most important questions that Les would always get um, is, what do you do when you have to go to the bathroom? <laughs> and so it's more of a fun book for, for bathrooms and stuff. And I just, my girlfriend and I started talking about it. I'm like, we could call it an Outback in the Bush. And, and just this idea of these women who are adventurers, you know, whether you're like in a dry suit underwater photographing sharks or you're at the top of a mountain you know, hanging off a cliff and sleeping there for three days, you know, how do women, when you're out there doing these crazy adventures, how do you deal with the things that we all deal with every day? And so we're collecting stories from women around the world um, and doing little illustrations to go with their crazy stories, because I know we all have them. I know I have a few. (laughs) And um, yeah, and then all the things we talked about as far as the the funeral and I'm oh I'm I'm putting up a storefront on my website from all of my images oh, from around the world so just setting all that up right now so and uh, and if and as far as uh, finding me really finding me if they're in Toronto drop me a line and um, we'll have a glass of wine or a coffee see I like mm. that most people say here's my website you're like no no we'll have some coffee oh, yeah. we'll have some wine there was something <laughs> yeah. incredibly altruistic that I saw on your website that really uh, spoke to me you're like. Oh, call me, and your number is there. Yeah, your phone number. Yeah, yeah so you're yeah. like, yeah. It's amazing. That, that's very cool. Yeah. I mean, that's a real connection to people. And well, you can't, you can't get hired. Um, I'm also working on a few documentaries um, right now, so those are, I'm very excited about those. Again, they're very, you know, cultural commentary type stories, um, one on radical retirees. You know, things just where we, I want to challenge how we think about things. Aging is one of them. So those are all coming out in the next, um, you know, year or so. And um, so hopefully you'll see my name at the Oscars. (laughs) I I, I wouldn't doubt it. I would not be surprised. I would not be surprised. Yeah. One, thing, one thing I'd throw in there is uh, I'm a big fan, of course, Survivor Man, you know, the series. And then also, of course, Beyond Survivor. I'm sorry, Beyond Survival and such like that. But I would just throw in here that more than you may think, you really, your photography, your eye made those yes. shows. Like, I, I love Les. He's wonderful. We interviewed him. You know what I mean? Like, I played mm-hmm. harmonica with him. It's great, right? But I'm telling you, he would, 
you did more than you have any idea. Absolutely. Yeah, we were, we were watching it, it leading up to your interview, watching it, and we're, we could see your touch throughout the whole thing. Just, oh, yeah. And I have the book as well. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the, the book is, we're very proud of the book. And, uh, you know, some of the things, you know, I felt so blessed to be a part of that team. You know, Beyond Survival, I think, for all of us, um, as far as the shows that we did, is, you know, one of our favorite series and experiencing the world in a way that, you know, travelers wouldn't normally experience, you know, because of the budgets that we had, you know, we're filming a come out in ceremony and, you know, very, it was just very blessed to be a part of, of these tragically, um, you know, these dying cultures. Yeah. Well, Laura, I hope you have a wonderful night. It's been incredible talking to you. I feel Thank very you. inspired. I feel like you guys are right next door, so I, I have some more wine if you want to come I know, over. hey. <laughs> <laughs>